<laughs> All right. Welcome everyone to the Twin Cities Less Meetup. My name is David Nielsen. I'm the facilitator today. We rotate and today we have James Carpenter with us. He's going to be uh, discussing and presenting on a less adoption um, with a, a company that it's a software and a hardware company. And so that'll be really interesting for us to hear about because typically we just deal with hard, I mean, software, right? But so that'll be really cool. And then um, we'll have a Q&A session. I think the presentation you're thinking is going to be 30 to 45 minutes, right? And then we'll have a Q&A session. So what, what we're trying to do is get through the presentation um, as best as we can. And then we'll have a Q&A session. So put your questions in the chat. I will be monitoring that, kind of organizing that, prioritizing things. If there's a lot of people asking the same question, you know, that'll go, come first. So um, it'll be really great for you to put your questions in there throughout. And then when we get to the q and I'm going to start uh, queuing it up for uh, the guest speakers. Also, uh, we have a, a, a mystery guest. Uh, so that's Mitya on the, uh, on the participant list there. And he's a development group manager. Uh, that worked uh, hand in hand with James to implement this less adoption. So uh, that'll be great, uh, you know, just to ask questions of both people and hear from both people. And, uh, you know, again, we're here because we're all interested in learning about large scale scrum implementations, what went well, and of course, what went wrong, you know, we want to, we really want to hear those nitty gritty learning lessons uh, because usually those are more insightful than, than some of the success stories. Uh, although this has both, so it should be a really meaty, good uh, presentation. So to introduce James, he's been a software engineer for 15 years, over 15 years, uh, leading agile transformation since 2012. Um, he's been a leader in two less adoptions. Uh, this, this, uh, this presentation will be on the first of the two. Um, and this presentation is also the basis for his less trainer uh, candidate process. So he, James is going to be one of the newest uh, certified less trainers, and this will be um, oh. part of that process. <laughs> we know you will. You're going to get it. Um, and so he's working with Craig Larman uh, to publish that on the less website. Um, and he's also been on a variety of other coaching engagements. He's an individual or excuse me. Yeah, individual executive or sorry, independent executive consultant uh, for Agile and uh, just brings a lot of great, great uh, perspectives. So uh, I will show where I'm supposed to show exactly where to find the, the reading materials. Go to the meetup. You're going to find uh, a pre-read content right here and you can click on that. And what it'll take you to is this. So you will have uh, you'll scroll down a bit and then there's pre-read handout in online format and PDF format. Uh, it was recommended that you read it before joining today, but if you weren't able to join, um, you know, you can ask clarifying questions. Nobody's gonna, you know, beat you up over it. Um, and if you open it up, it's got, it starts out with a timeline. It's got some introductory biography and then we're gonna pretty much get into the presentation. So I don't wanna steal your thunder. Uh, if you can keep your webcams on, try and engage. Um, that's it. Thanks. So I'm going to turn it over to you. Oh, uh, okay. James. Yeah, go ahead. Thank you. So, so first off, I'll just say hi. Um, thank you for everyone coming and uh, especially for those who have done the pre-reading. Um, I'm really looking forward to all the great questions, and I I'll tell you a little bit more that I what I can about uh, Mitya, which of course obviously isn't his real name, um, but he was at this client that this case study is about. Um, this is not your normal director, um, very uh, uh, exceptionally high emotional intelligence, um, running uh, a very significant group doing some very hardcore low level work. Um, uh, He's worked at a variety of start. I know it's at least at one major startup now. Um, uh, very hard hitting hardware, software engineer, firmware engineer. Um, I would say more great things, but uh, I'm worried about uh, revealing the client. So uh, fantastic guy and, and, and one of my best friends. So I'm very fortunate to have had opportunity to get to know Mitria. Mitria, do you want to say anything else? 
Uh, first of all, thanks for the uh, amazing introduction, James. Um, no, so uh, happy to be here. Actually, uh, excited to, to share what uh, we went through in the transformation in the team and um, with guidance of Jane, James and with uh, um, just yeah, happy to share what what uh, what we went through and answer any questions and help any way I can. Okay. Well, I'm trying to find my notes that I lost. Maybe while James is looking for his notes. Yes, yes. You know, one thing I can um, I, I can say for sure is that um, you know the, the team that that I, I was leading at the time um, was was uh, operating pretty well and uh, with a certain status quo that's that's known in in our field and would have been doing the same thing. Um, and and uh, I think, from what I know now, missing out on a lot of aspects that uh, uh, Agile development provides, if, if it wasn't for James uh, coaching us through it and um, helping tremendously and in introducing us to all of these concepts. So we're gonna go through this as, as David suggested, Mitri and I are gonna do this together. Um, we're going to try to cover the, uh, the main figures uh, uh, pretty quickly so that we can get to the questions. So our intention here is to mostly cover the content quickly, not take a lot of questions. Um, if there's any clarifying questions, that's, that's fine, but mostly save your, your really meaty stuff um, for after and please write them down because the whole point is to get to those. That's where the real value is, is letting y'all ask the questions. Um, and, but we just want to give you a little bit of over overview first to how to help to set the stage, which we think will take us about 25 minutes or so. All right. So, uh, context. Um, so this, this is a hardware, Mitra, you want to explain this hardware product? You can do it better than I can. Um, yeah, I, I can do it. I, I, it's, it's a very nice diagram, so it's easy to explain based on this diagram. So maybe going from uh, from hardware to software. So the on the left side uh, in James' diagram, uh, the the well, motherboard. Who uses so, this thing? Who are customer base? It. Who buys this thing? Yeah. What is it? Um, so the, the the customers are uh, data centers uh, for this particular company, this particular product, mostly enterprise data centers, but um, really this type of product is used in cloud or enterprise setting, uh, but um, data center product, basically. And it's a, uh, so the, the, the purpose of the it's product- It's a data is, center on a forklift, right? Yeah. It, it's got your storage, yeah. it's got your compute, it's got your networking, it has the software to manage the whole mess. Um, if you're not gonna run on AWS, um, and you needed to do this yourself, you would have to have a lot of infrastructure in order to support that. This lets you buy that on a, off the shelf with a big that's, check. That's true. Yep, that's true. And and this uh, you know this product is um, um, by now uh, you know quite quite mature, and, and it originated even before AWS had things like uh, on-prem data centers. Um, so this would yeah this would this would um, uh, satisfy many needs, including the one if you want to build kind of on on-prem cloud. One of the big features of this data of this uh, product is the uh, density. This uh, blade concept um, is uh, a m more dense. Um, you're you're able to populate compute more densely than if you have uh, you know kind of what's called pizza boxes or um, various. Um, rack unit height servers that kind of slide into the racks in the data center. So the, the details, the blade motherboard is the really the compute module. It has uh, processors, it has memory, it has uh, IO in terms of, uh, so all the network, all the IO is uh, uh, consolidated over uh, network. So it's uh, ethernet, uh, you see there as a NIC, but uh, over Ethernet, uh, it, it's also able to uh, encapsulate other things like fiber channel and uh, various storage protocols. 
So this is a compute module. And as you can see, the compute module, there are eight compute modules uh, in this chassis, pretty common in the industry, six to eight um, is a common, common form factor. Um, and encapsulated in a physical chassis. Uh, and uh, the chassis itself has a um, chassis controller that uh, monitors the environmentals and reports to the managing software, which we'll get to um, in a moment, the details of each compute node, the details of all the compute nodes, the um, chassis details, and so on. Uh, one, th one more thing I didn't mention is the node controller back to the left side of the diagram. The node controller is the uh, a module that allows configurations to flow from the software to the, uh, to the, to the BIOS on the motherboard and the static data uh, to come out from the motherboard and uh, go back so static and dynamic, dynamic uh, such as environmental and uh, voltages and temperatures and things like that. So, so, go so back. I, yeah, the, um, yeah Mitri, I remember in the old days uh, when I was at a seismic processing shop, you had to go around with a VT100 terminal and plug a serial cable into the back of a, of a pizza box. Um, yeah. And obviously these servers may be off in a cage you know, thousands of miles away, and you need the ability to to administer them remotely. If you need to change yeah. BIOS settings, you need the ability to do that, right? Yeah, yeah. So, so, um, so that's what that's about, right? Right. And so this node controller will provide that as well. Uh, the kind of KVM uh, KVM piece, uh, so that you can access. Uh, so it 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 can be configured and uh, worked with in two ways. One is uh, kind of hands-free completely remotely and all, and hands-on completely remotely. So hands-free, maybe this is a good time to get to the, the GUI, MCS GUI and, and, and administration piece that's on the top right. So the main, the main object, uh, objective of this piece of software is um, really user interaction with all of the blades in a, in a chassis in a chassis and all of the chassis that are under the management of this software uh, and it has some um, high high limit of number of chassis it can manage uh, and again also this is this is your uh, this is the user's view into the health of every every uh, cell you know, in this uh, cell being the blade or every CPU within every blade or every module of uh, memory in every blade. Um, also, uh, its objective is to provide uh, compute configuration, networking configuration, storage configuration, uh, which is then distributed to the relevant nodes, relevant blades, relevant chassis and so on. And it, uh, it, it in return, it, it it gives a view of um, the kind of accum accumulated view of all the hardware uh, under its control. Mitri, thank you. Um, I think it might be useful if I give you, let me describe this from a slightly different perspective as well, because everything he said is super useful, relevant. It might be a little overwhelming for some. Um, I think it's it, there's a few facets that are interesting here from a, from a, like a coaching uh, transformational kind of experience. First off is all of this stuff at the higher level, this administrator GUI and all that, that is effectively middleware. Um, you know, it's the sort of thing that in, in another world might be written in Java, might be written in C++. You are running on stable hardware that is predictable. Um, you might be running embedded Linux, you might be running some sort of, you know, it may be, it may come across as a network device, but it's basically middleware. It just happens to be responsible for managing this big monstrosity, right? Now, as you go down into, uh, down and you get close to the hardware, there will be custom drivers for those network cards. There will be 
custom hardware in the blade. You get into very custom bespoke hardware. Much of the work uh, Mitria's group was doing was uh, BIOS code. This was, you know, there is no operating system. There, there is no threading. The C libraries, the standard C libraries are only partially implemented. Um, uh, you're cross compiled and deployed to target. Um, so you have this broad span of uh, when you get a when you get hardware. Um, sometimes the prototype hardware is flaky. Sometimes the flakiness is in the firmware. Sometimes the firmware can be adjusted to work around the flakiness, sometimes not. So there's the synthesis of custom funky hardware, custom funky software way down where the Morlocks live. But all this is also coupled with what at the high level is really a bunch of middleware code. And all of these things are kind of glued together in a very complex overall product with a few thousand engineers working on the thing. Um, the other facet, uh, which Mitria mentioned as well, is uh, this is deployed on premise. So just like your, your cell phone, um, you know, when, when a new version of iOS comes out, everyone doesn't get a new, a new hardware, right? A lot of people keep your old phone and that new software runs on the old hardware. But some of the new features only work for the new in development generation of the hardware. You know, that say they're back in Apple's labs. So the, the focus, the customer base is a much different customer base the complexity of the product and the amount of money involved is much different. So here you're talking about huge checks from a small number of customers instead of, you know, uh, uh, small checks from millions of customers um, or tens of millions or hundreds of millions, how many people Apple sells to. Um, so the, the hardware generations is an interesting dynamic that plays a part and it's not as if it's a hosted situation where you're in control of the entire environment like you would be in a software as a service. Um, anything else before we move on, Mitria, that we think we should um, cover? You know, you know, one thing uh, maybe relevant specifically to this transformation experience is that the some of the so some of the pieces of soft, uh, software and uh, embedded software and uh, as James described it uh, correctly, middleware. They are, uh, you know, their life cycle, their release cycle is independent of external world uh, to a degree. So you, you, you invent a feature or you perceive that the user needs a feature, you add a feature to the GUI, uh, nobody else kind of externally, the marketplace externally not necessarily driving it. Um, the one exception is the the bio specifically, and it's really driven by, the cycle is driven by uh, a number of things. One of them is Intel, uh, in this case, Intel, but Intel or AMD uh, uh, release schedule. So when the time, the time that Intel or AMD announce a new CPU, all the server vendors, um, all the compute vendors say, would like to ride that wave of uh, adoption. Also, we have a we have a product. Also, so there are kind of multiple cycles in play here. One is cycle is sort of a bug fix cycle where the release hardware, release software is being maintained and there are, uh, periodic releases. But there is also this big long cycle of uh, many 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 months, more than a year months. Um, that is oftentimes is an opportunity to, to do a complete overhaul of software, of BIOS specifically. That, that's all I wanted to add. Yes, and, you can't, and if you miss those dates, you get the prototype chips and they give you new generations of prototype chips that are always having less trouble than the previous ones. Um, but if you miss the date, you miss gazillions of dollars per day for not having been ready when Intel put it on the shelf. Yeah, yeah, and and you miss uh, you miss also the you know the uh, kind of marketing dollars that are not yours that are external you know industry <laughs> industry wave right industry wave is oh. is, is important to ride uh, and, and not be behind and then you know catch up. So thank you. 
Um, there's this timeline that talks about the engagement. Um, you'll see that uh, uh, this, it's very helpful to keep this timeline separate. Um, if you read the pre-read, um, I even suggested that you print it out and take notes on it. Because as we go through the other figures, sometimes it helps you pull the context together because uh, you can see what happened here. Um, and you can connect the other stuff to this timeline and, and, it, and it really helps. So uh, you might even put that in a separate window if you have the separate screen space for it or even print out just this one. It can be useful to take notes on. Um, so there was an initial diagnostic. So, so know that about the timeline, but I'll move on. Um, so when I, let's, let's move. Um, okay, there was an initial team that we stood up that was indeed an end-to-end -end feature team. Um, it, this, this was a single scrum team that was directly interacting with the people that were using the product. It happened to be a diagnostic capability that was being added. It would, it would satisfy a very natural requirements area of the, uh, in, in less terms, of the overall MCS product, uh, the modular compute system product. The, uh, we're not going to spend much time talking about it. Um, you're more than welcome to ask questions on it later. Um, but know that there was an initial team stood up. That initial team was very much a full vertical slice. We pulled people from different teams that had the skill set to work in every component that they needed to touch. Um, and again, you know, it was a little bit, it was a bunch of stuff in the middle diagnostics and then a little bit of functionality all over the place. And that team pulled together a cross functional feature team that could do it. Um, here's some happy team members. Um, here was their definition of done. Um, there's some uh, interesting political nuances that show up that are in the caption here and talked about if you did the pre-read that might make for good questions later. Um, uh, and now we're down to, oh, when we start talking about the work that, that we did with uh, Mitria, um, we only did it for, we initially formed our teams just for the new in development hardware. If we were back to the iPhone analogy, this would be equivalent to saying, for all the iPhones that are in the field today, of all the different variations, the different generations of them, we're not gonna focus on software for that. We're gonna let that be whatever it is and let the teams that are working on that, on that code related to those older products, we're just gonna leave them alone. But for the new, but for development of the newest generation of iPhones that's in the lab, or in this case, the newest generation of hardware of this MCS product, we're going to start to build these less like structures for the BIOS team, which is only which is where the interest was. Um, and initially, that was very much just within this component. It was really a component team, um, which would make, uh, yeah, we'll get to that. Um, and then over time, we worked to continue to grow our way towards the surface, grow our way up to the, uh, the user interface and become a more natural requirement area and to begin to slowly cross train the team to be able to do small amounts of work in these other components. So that for example, if you added a new uh, attribute that you need to be able to configure in BIOS, you would want this less like structure of teams to be able to even make the changes in the GUI layer and anything else in between that needed to be made. Now we didn't completely get there, but we started to go in that direction. Um, we didn't go as far as we would like to have gone, but certainly that was happening before some massive layoffs uh, 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 started to hit us. Um, it's also interesting to know that when we first talked about BIOS, um, out of what, 30, 40 people, mostly like one or two people would know a particular file or a particular small micro bit of functionality. If you wanted to tune memory, only this one guy was mostly the guy who did all the memory tuning stuff. And if you wanted to do uh, some other bit of work, um, it was only one or two people that knew how to do that. This idea of working more cross-functionally, cross even within BIOS, which is itself a big massive thing, um, uh, that was not the norm prior to the adoption. So to initially have gone, well, we're just gonna work all the way up to the, to the GUI from day one is not something that there would have been the institutional will 
and there wouldn't have even been the uh, probably the interest or the maybe even the ability of the team to stretch that far or the teams to stretch that far that soon. It was a stretch just to say, hey, as teams, we're going to take whatever comes up the top of the product backlog and we're going to work it. Um, regardless of what aspect of BIOS we have to touch. Even that was a challenge to begin with. And as the teams matured, as uh, they became more cross-functional, as we ran effective retrospectives, it became increasingly self-evident to them, well, we really should be making some of these other changes ourselves. And so a team that was kind of focused in the areas that went up to the GUI um, started to get agreement with uh, some of the key tech leads and other aspects and other parts other components to make those changes themselves and just do some peer review. So they started to work in that direction, but we never got as far as we wanted. But understand that even within the BIOS, there was a lot of narrowness uh, initially. Uh, Mitri, any, any comments there? Yeah, I was- Watch our time, uh, so, by the way. Uh, Keep going. Uh, as quickly as I can. Um, so the, you know, th this is very, very fundamental, I think, to the challenge of adapting um, in any form of agile in a, in a bio space is because this is simply how things are done. This is, uh, you know, BIOS is a very well, well established uh, industry, uh, well established software development practice and uh, specialization is um, not only common, but it's key in some, in some, some uh, aspects uh, of BIOS development. Um, or at least it's perceived to be key to successful buyers development. And another very important thing that I probably should have mentioned at the beginning is that it is uh, a conviction that you don't do agile in former. You know, I knew I uh, I'm not I don't I'm not on video, but you know, air quotes knew that it's not done, and uh, I knew because uh, people who I respect, people who have been in the industry for a long time, uh, told me that they know that it's not done. Um, and it really wasn't until uh, James um, came to the to the organization, not specifically for the bias purposes, but for other uh, components and was coaching them. Uh, uh, I don't know if James, I should go through the story Sure, here, I think, I think the like... fact that you, you okay. wanted it. I didn't force any yeah. of this on you. Right, right. While you were forcing it on other people, no. no, no, no. <laughs> I, I became I became interested in uh, uh, you know in, interested in uh, what what was what was going on with you know other groups and what they were doing. But again, I I was convinced and knew that it's not done in the BIOS and it shouldn't be done in the BIOS. I had no basis in it, but I just knew because I was and um, it was a, a James uh, kind of slowly arranged for. Uh, through 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 some social interaction with other um, management managers, and uh, finally, uh, in dropping into my office and kind of drawing things on the board that uh, some of them didn't make sense and some of them made sense logically, even though I didn't understand any of the agile terminology. Uh, finally, there was a meeting where it was supposed to be half an hour, an hour, and uh, you know, two and a half hours later. Um, I, I was convinced that there is really, uh, you know, nothing prescriptively uh, prescriptive against doing this kind of work in our environment. It's challenging, and we should we have to solve the challenges that are specific to our type of development and specific to the uh, timelines and specific to dependencies. You know, in the hardware software world, the dependencies are different than when it's um, you know kind of software only world, um, but the you know the fundamentals of how you know how people are treated in in, in this environment you know differently and how um, estimates and uh, deliverables and retrospectives and you know a lot of things that I, I always felt that it's hard for managers to implement without a particular framework and this framework gave a lot of uh, a, a lot of opportunities to just implement great uh, work environment, I felt. Thank you. Very helpful. Um, org chart. So when I came in, uh, so I had a few phone calls. It was, you know, uh, with the, the sponsor, which is not Mitria, it was a different guy. Um, 
uh, and from the time that I had a yes to the time that I was in the door, it took a month, month and a half, something like that, all the paperwork done. Uh, once I showed up, I one of the early meetings I had for the first time in person is I finally got to meet this uh, senior VP slash general manager in person. And I sat in this person's office and uh, amazingly supportive, definitely an engineer's engineer, kind of, you know, you've got a lot of patents on the wall type. Okay. So uh, think MIT type or MIT of India type. And he really impressed me because he said, you know, James, the real question is not what you can do for me. The question is, what can I do for you? And he made it very clear that he had an open door. And if I ever needed anything and he could help in, 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 in any way that was useful and, and provide, uh, uh, you know, exec allow me to do power borrowing of his executive status, um, completely open to that, right? So I could not have asked for more support than I received from this initial uh, SVP. And that's when it was during that time that we started to work to set up that initial diagnostics team that I talked about. And this was before Mitri and I got, got seriously engaged. Um, within two months, this person was gone. Um, there was a lot of financial pressure to uh, uh, do something to make to help the profitability of the org. Um, and a new, a new VP, SVP came in. Great, great person, uh, very skilled, very knowledgeable, not quite an engineer's engineer. And the optimizing goal of this person was, was not the same as the original SVP. So um, I almost never spent any significant time with this SVP. It was very difficult to get, the, to get this person's ear, um, if not impossible. Yet with some of the momentum that was started initially, um, we still continued to run and they continued to pay my bill rate. So I'm still flying back and forth um, every week and you know that gets expensive. And uh, there was still interest in that. There was, certainly, there was certainly a lot of lip service to Agile there just wasn't the same kind of, you know, how can I help make this happen that I had with that original SVP. And that, that fundamental change in, in leadership is critical. And you'll see that again right there in that uh, uh, here you have that original SVP. And then two or three months later, we have this change. And you'll also see that in the timeline if you're following along in the timeline. Um, now, later, way towards the end of the engagement, um, you'll find that Mitria is reporting up through this hardware VP. So even though uh, this is a hardware VP, the truth is there's a lot of software, there's a lot of firmware under that, including the BIOS code, which is, um, you know, it's, uh, if assembly code counts as firmware and low level C code, not C++, but C cross compiled to a target counts as software, which it, which it does, um, that's still included software. Um, so, don't be confused by the hardware VP nomenclature, but do pay attention that the hardware VP was very supportive. Mostly the hardware VP was, hey, Mitria, if you say this is the right thing to do, then go do it. And so there was enough trust in Mitria that if, that if Mitria was on board, then, uh, then this hardware VP was on board. And there also was a QA, um, a VP who was very supportive. Um, but the software VP who was involved in a lot of the teams that worked on that, uh, the very the very much the middleware stuff <laughs> was more passively aggressive. Uh, when the hardware VP left towards the end of my engagement there, about a year, a little over a year and a half, a little under a year and a half there, um, all of a sudden everybody started reporting into that VP, that software VP, and that sort of caused some things to tumble. So that will come up and that's important. Um, geography. So uh, Mitria's, all Mitria's folks were in uh, Portland and the San, greater San Francisco area. Um, there were also some people in India that were doing, uh, 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 that were doing uh, uh, BIOS code. Uh, they were reporting to a different uh, director level, 
they didn't they didn't join till we got up to that hardware VP. Um, and again, you'll see that on the org chart. Um, but they were almost all co-located. So the group in in Portland was, you know, I don't know, it has like 30 desks in it plus a server room, something like that. And uh, in San Francisco, you've got uh, several floors of people, but all the people that were working with for Dimitri were all clustered in a corner. And we actually changed offices a few times. We changed buildings. There's some re refurbishment going on and whatnot. But we were always in some co-located area. And the QAs that we got to help us that were from the QA. Now, uh, uh, we treated them just like normal team members. We brought them in and they were part of our team um, and treated like any other team member for all practical purposes, except they were still reporting up through a different reporting chain which caused a little bit of problems, but not a lot because we had that, uh, we had the support that we did from that software VP, uh, sorry, from the quality assurance VP, not VP, director. No, VP, yeah, VP. Appear to Mitria's hardware VP. Um, if Victor were here editing my case study, Victor would make sure to point out that these are really like Think of them as testers because quality is an outcome of the system. Uh, quality assurance is something you bolt on is a is a misnomer, and he's right. I've gone ahead and left these labeled as QA because that's what you're going to recognize them as. Um, know that the concept of quality assurance is something you bolt onto an org obviously doesn't work. Um, so Victor was taking uh, taking issue with as we edited the case study with some of the uh, how do we word that and how do we pull that out. And we'll have to tweak it a bit and figure out how. Um, here is an interesting trick. So remember I said that we, we said we're only going to bother to fix the newest hardware generation. And we'll let all the old hardware run the way, it, the way it's historically run. So for the teams that are in India, doing bug fixes to the existing legacy, uh, legacy BIOS code base, we're just going to leave them alone, let them run under the standard waterfall that they're used to being run with. And even those that are reporting up through Mitria that are still doing bug fixes and such and small improvements to the older code base that's related to the older generation of hardware, we're still going to leave them under, under an old mechanism. We're not going to pull them into this less stock structure. As, as, uh, uh, as BIOS engineers that were reporting up through Mitria wrapped up some of those, uh, some of the work on the legacy on the legacy systems, or the legacy hard supporting legacy hardware generations, um, we would roll them into this structure. So the uh, so we started with just three teams within four months or so, I, I don't remember exactly, it kind of morphed a bit. We had pulled in uh, two more teams because Mitria had people that had rolled off doing the other work and we rolled them into, into new teams. And then we may have shuffled the team boundaries a bit or the teams may have shuffled their own team boundaries. They actually decided uh, who their teams were. Except in Portland's case, it was kind of obvious that Portland would form its own team. Um, now, what this did, is it delayed the politics of dealing with the org chart and the aspects in India until we had successfully demonstrated a lot of success. So we had, we had shown what was possible with this new approach. And I think that had we not lost the hardware VP, we would have been able to uh, solve the India problem as well. Mitri and I would have flown over back to India, had some conversations, we would have worked the politics, we would have smoothed it out and we would have been able to fix that structural issue uh, eventually had we not lost our hardware VP. Um, so it's an interesting strategy. It's very unusual. And it's also unusual that we're growing from the bottom of the tech stack instead of going kind of from the top of this tech stack and working our way deeper and deeper. So it's a very odd place that we started, uh, but it worked. Um, I'm watching my time. Uh, so when we launched, we got in a room for several days, brainstormed, put lots of stuff on the wall. Um, the knowledge of what was needed was dispersed more broadly than any, any other time I've seen it, where uh, every one of these guys are rocket scientists, guys. These are, these are very sharp engineers. 
um, first rate. And, but because of the way they had been working, it wasn't uncommon that person A would know one small piece of the pie, one Paul's piece of the puzzle, and person B would know another piece of the puzzle, person C would know another piece of the puzzle. And you had to go through all 30, 40 people as a group. We had to get in a room and, and brainstorm and figure out what was involved. Um, Mitri, can you talk about that for like, I don't know, a minute or so? You always tell it nicely. You know, we were in that uh, corner room yeah. with all the glass and we brainstormed for, got a bunch of stuff out of our head. Um, yeah, so this, this uh, you mean the, the, the kind of the very first or one of the very first, right? Yeah, the, the very, yeah, the very first two or three days that we were doing Inception. This is after we had run through training with everybody. But yeah. We were ready to launch the teams. Yeah. So there, there were, you know, there was some challenges of, of doing that. Um, one of them is, um, maybe I'll start with challenges. One, one of the challenges was that um, the team was distributed and our objective was to create a single, um, single, uh, uh, you know, single list of stories. Um, and uh, as James mentioned, the, the team was kind of separated by specialties. And so some, some specialties ended up in Portland and some specialties ended up in San Jose. And yet we were working on a single um, uh, kind of storyline. Um, and, um, and we had flown in the Portlanders, right? They had flown in for that week, as I recall. We No, they, they were on the call, on the phone. Oh, OK. So they, yeah, they did kind of, they did their own and we did our own yeah, and sorry. that was part of the challenge. Uh, and- uh, But video is ubiquitous here. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. That, that, they make the that, hardware that does it, so it's cheap. Yeah. So <laughs> the, you know, so the, doing, um, how should I say, the, the, doing this kind of work was also new, you know, uh, it's the first time that uh, everybody's work that they know how to do, they know how, you know, the sequence of events in every cycle, uh, they, they had to break it down and write it into consumable steps. Um, and so that, that was it. That was a challenge, but you know it's interesting. After initial, uh, it took a little bit to get going, um, partly because when you know how to do something, you don't really have the steps exactly. I mean, you, you know, you just sit down and and do it, and then it's done and shipped, and you move on to the next thing. And so people had to think, okay, how how does how is it that I do what I do? What are the steps? What are the uh, features that I enable? Uh, you know, how do I call them? How do I, how do I change the wording from, you know, I need to enable this dim to a user story? Uh, I think that was one of the big, you know, shifting moments, shifting moments or challenges is to. But but that uh, came later, from, right? We just got sticky notes on the wall. That came in our later. meeting. That's true. Right, right, right. Um, and, and then, you know, one of the interesting things that happened is that uh, now everybody's tasks, everybody's uh, store, stories or tasks that would later uh, be changed into stories or ready really to become stories, they were on everyone's display. They were on the walls, they were on the windows. As James said, you know, that, that room was mostly, I would say half walls, half windows. It was a corner corner uh, conference room, and uh, you know these stickers were on the, on on the windows and the walls everywhere on the whiteboards, and you know then then it came time to kind of pull it all together, and people started looking at uh, tasks that are in in other areas, um, not an area of their own expertise, and actually from that came a lot of contribution to completeness. Of, of these tasks, of these features, is that people, again, when you have familiarity with a subject, you may omit things that are 
that come naturally to you. And, and um, so from this next step of um, kind of cross-pollinating the team uh, came more completeness of the, the, the big picture of what needs to be done um, to get, in this case, BIOS from one stage to another stage. For those of you familiar with blitz planning, it's basically what we did. You know, silent writing for a few minutes, everybody writes all the things they think they need. We'd put it on a wall, Mitri would group it um, into different groups. Then we would, uh, we'd find logical groupings and then we'd go again. When Mitria got tired, someone else on the team would stand up and kind of do the facilitation because I'm always trying to back myself up to, to uh, lead the least possible, right? So the more I can let them lead, the better, the more they own it. Um, and they certainly didn't, they just needed to point it in the right direction. Um, so normal blitz planning activities, but it took like a day and a half to get it out of everybody's head. It, it did not come out easy. Yeah. There's just so much of it. I've never seen this much information scattered as broadly as it was scattered here. Um, in such, you know, really sharp guys um, and gals. Um, after that, we once we had the sprints up and going, we were already in the first sprint. Um, we started doing what was basically a form of cross-team refinement or multi-team refinement. But in this case, it was the people who know the most about these particular stickies, let's get together and let's flush out better PBIs. Now we wrote them in user story format, but Obviously, they're not strictly speaking user stories um, because they're really about a component. Um, the, uh, uh, but we would do that to the point that we had everything flushed out in our electronic tool. Then we printed everything back out. We threw it all on the wall and we started looking for, uh, Mitri and I started looking for what is a natural sequence of this because Mitri was acting as a product owner or to be precise in less terms, a fake product owner because the real product owner would be actual product management, which we weren't yet to that point until we had, could grow into a more full requirement area. Um, but we put everything on the wall, started to find where things had affinities. We eventually ended up with what is sort of a combination of a snake-like product backlog and a user story map. Um, so it's just kind of a story mapping type of exercise. Um, and then of course, as we would do this, we would bring in, uh, we would do touch, we would touch base with whoever we needed. So we would bring in, uh, if Mitri and I were here focused on, you know, two or three of these, these uh, uh, sticky notes here, we would uh, grab someone from the teams that knows more about them and ask clarifying questions. And then when it made sense, we'd bring in the whole team and shuffle the board more, right? So the whole teams did multi-team refinement to dream these up. And then Mitri and I threw them on a wall again and tried to massage them, pulled in more people for insight anytime we needed it. And then towards the end, we made sure to bring everybody in uh, as well as putting the, the guys in Portland on video and have them double check everything we did um, and see what we look, see what we overlooked and whatnot. And then we also did a quick uh, affinity estimation or elephant board or whatever you want to call it. It's the affinity estimation technique um, to get a rough uh, uh, sizing on them all. Um, after that, we were able to transition to uh, more regular cadenced refinement. But that was how we got our initial product backlog flushed out, uh, for the, which is really a component backlog. We always had a handy helper if we needed some tape. Um, and here you can see a task board in the background. So very handy helper there. Um, definition of done. Historically, this code had been, they were, it was as bad as you would think, um, as you could, as you would ever see the, uh, they were doing copy paste reuse from one generation of hardware code to another. And we're not making use of the pluggable layers that uh, existed from a, a, an AMI BIOS that was given to us that was in customized. And this team, uh, they, or the, these teams, they said, we're tired of this, we're gonna stop it. And, and you know, I didn't tell them you should do this. I didn't know enough about BIOS, they knew. They knew the problems were there. 
um, they just hadn't been empowered to, uh, or felt empowered to stop it. And so when they were empowered to stop it, they said, hey, let's stop doing what we've done in the past. Let's make it where never again do we have to do this copy paste reuse. Let's start using pluggable layers unless we absolutely can't for whatever reason. Um, and so they put that in their definition of done from I think the first sprint. Um, uh, it evolved a bit later. You see a little more refined version of the same thing. Um, triage guidelines, this deals with uh, what's a real fire, what's a fake fire. And it would be nice to, uh, uh, for an individual team member to say, hey, this is a fake fire. And Mitri is not here to tell you as a, as a product owner, but if he were, he would say he would say it is, and this is why he would say it is. So this allows us to be respectful of the product owner's uh, judgment as to what is and isn't most important, while allowing team members to respond instantly when there is an ad hoc request that may be a real fire. And then it also allows us to benefit from the collective wisdom of the entire of all the teams of all the team members of all the, from within within the entire product development group. Um, of their wisdom of what should and shouldn't be a real fire. So we were able to have a group discussion about it and come to, uh, uh, come to consensus on what it should be and validate, uh, uh, validate that decision with uh, the product owner. Um, so it is the product owner's decision, but it's informed by the group. And then it allows us to respond very quickly. It's almost like classes of service um, uh, and pull rules in Kanban. It's a variation of that. Um, here's some reference content. I'm not going to read it, uh, but it should generate some good questions. Um, let's see. It's been, it's almost six. Do we want to take a five minute break and then come back with questions? Sure. I think that's a, that's a fine idea. Give everybody a quick break and then, and then we'll jump right into questions. I have uh, a, a few questions uh, from others lined up. I got a few for myself. I'll put at the end and uh, we'll jump right into them. So I uh, really appreciate that presentation. Thank you. Yeah, I was trying to tee up the first question. So the first one I got there is how did this team structure evolution tie in with the training of the BIOS teams, specifically to help resolve key team dysfunctions? So, so let me ask the first part, and then we'll have to clarify the second part. Um, the, the first part is, as you see in the timeline, over the course of, uh, because we had so many people involved, it took me two cohorts to train San Francisco. Uh, for everyone that was going to be in the initial BIOS teams. And it took me another, which is like two or three days of training, I think two days. And then, uh, so it took in one week, I was able to train two cohorts uh, in San Francisco. And then the following week, I trained one cohort in, uh, uh, in Portland. And then, and Mitria went with me to both of the, uh, to both of the San Francisco he attended and, you know, participated. I wouldn't say he quite co-trained with me, but he certainly was, was active uh, in a leadership capacity within the training. And then when we trained Portland and we made sure to pull in the people that we thought were going to be QAs on the team as well, even though they technically reported to a different part of the org. And then when uh, did Portland, uh, it wasn't Mitria, but it was a friendly, uh, 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 director involved, uh, the same one that had helped with the diagnostics team. And again, we made sure to line up some QA talent that was going to be there when we did that. So it took about two weeks of back-to-back -back training to train everybody up. The following week, we launched all, we did that, the team kickoff activities that uh, included you know, uh, what is our definition of done? What are our working agreements? What are, uh, uh, what are our, let's self form into teams. What, who do, what do we want our team boundaries to be? Who's in what team and self select into what team you want to be in. Um, 
but of course the the thing that took most of the time there was that brainstorming of of getting our product backlog out of our head the other stuff only took about half a day in this case um so it was remarkably quick for the other stuff but the product backlog stuff was a, was a bear um and this is because this team had been working together for a while so to answer the question of when did the structure how did the structure and tra training tie in we trained and we immediately launched the new structure you know the next week so so instant you know boom boom and we were instantly in the new structure as soon as we trained and we launched um but there was a what was the question again there's a second part to the question it's about the um i think he wants to know about the the key team dysfunctions and maybe maybe mitcher would like to jump in there too you know what 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 were because i had a similar question like what were the motivational factors that you made you appreciate james approach with less you know what problems oh, yeah. okay. what problems or team dysfunctions did you see that you you're like you're you're like, yeah, this is this is going to help with that. And James, Mitra, you're up. <laughs> yes, sir, go ahead. Oh, we'll we'll come right back. We'll come right back to you, Julian. Sorry, one second. Okay. So the, you know, first of all, no team dysfunctions. Obviously, it was perfect team. Um, but you know, there, um, maybe I'll start with David. Your second part, second part of the question: What made me uh, become interested and in, convinced that, uh, uh, you know, using James' time and expertise to train the team and to really lead, help lead the team, co-lead the team through this uh, transition would be valuable, is that uh, somehow I had a sense uh, that, that um, this less structure would, um, would identify um, problems, if you will. So problems such as, um, what's the word I'm looking for? The inefficiencies, for example, problems such as inefficiencies, uh, problems such as um, people's deliverables on a weekly, bi-weekly basis and tracking those deliverables. Uh, problems such as, you know, keeping this a flat structure, yet having leads that are actively and visibly leading the team and teams. Um, and, you know, I also saw this special specialization that James described very well as a problem as well you know if one person does uh you know one small already specialized but bios, bios is already specialized and if one person does specialized of specialized you know not only it's a uh i think it's a negative in the kind of long-term career point of view but it's also negative from from business point of view organizational point of view you know it's harder to fill in um uh, for for peaks uh, in in some areas when there are valleys in, in other areas in terms of uh, uh, workload, so and, and it, you know it's just it's great to have the entire team understanding the everything from top to bottom. Being, you know, as James says, you know, be, being able to stitch from 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 top to bottom the whole software. Uh, if you have people that 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 don't understand, you know, imagine you have in in the BIOS area, right, which is again for most of the world is just this one area, one small area. And in that area, there's a person who understands just one little corner. How, how does the dim initialize? And that's it. Not to diminish <laughs> that expertise. It's a, it's a very, very specialized, very important and uh, very difficult part. But uh, wouldn't it be nice if that person can also do, you know, simple things like selecting a boot device. Uh, so, so those are, you know, I think those are all problems. And I think those problems, um, less addre addressed very well. And it also exposed problems that, uh, you know, perhaps um, were, not, were not visible, you know, in, ter in terms of how people work with each other, you know, you're not uh, with, with the approach that we took and structure that James helped us implement and guided us, guided us through implementing. 
every uh, two weeks we were all together and and discussing what happened in the last two weeks and what went well, what didn't. You know, in retrospective, uh, I think that was a tremendous help. Um, we also, you know, we added some practices that um, I thought were cool. Uh, I, I don't know. If, I, I know not everybody on the team thought they were cool. Uh, like we before the interest <laughs> before the <laughs> retrospective, we did uh, like improv warm up exercises. You know, I I was freshly uh, graduated from an improv uh, class uh, at the evening evening class at uh, at, at Stanford at the time, back back when we used to do these things like go in person to classes. Um, and, and I thought it was great. You know, it's it's not uh, like to be the best comedian, but it's really just to uh, they really have nothing to do with comedy. They just have to do with being comfortable among other people and knowing that, you know, nobody dies in the process. Uh, I thought they were great, but, you know, not everybody loved it, for sure. Yeah, I'll just well, make a comment. Worked. I think the improv thing is great because you have to say yes and. You, you can never negate yeah. someone else's part of the story. You can only add to it. And when there's a lot of big egos on a team uh that can help them start to build on other people's ideas rather than just make it all their own but yeah that, that was good i want to go back to um i want to i want to go back to julian because it was originally julian's question and i want to see if he has any clarifying follow-up questions so go uh, ahead, i i appreciate that i was i was going to try to chime in to clarify <laughs> on the way but um james and Mitya, you guys addressed what i was asking i was looking at your timeline james and that's yes, where sir. i got the team dysfunction in month seven and I'm wondering if the oh. self-selection process that the teams did as they were integrated into your your team, your BIOS teams, if that was what was helping resolve some of that team dysfunction that you alluded to. So that's what I was trying uh, to get at. But I think you and Mitya both me. addressed what I was asking. It's on the timeline. Actually, I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm trying to think what was a seven month. And I, I think there was one, uh, you know, there, there was another, there oh, was another yeah. aspect of... Uh, <laughs> this was it is. this was the grumpiness in 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 uh uh portland wasn't completely on board right and although you weren't there for the training and we did the kickoff quasi remotely i think there were one or two people that might have been in san francisco but i'm not sure but you and i did a trip pretty quickly after we kicked them off and kind of nudged them a little more that was the yeah yeah. Okay. Let me be quiet. No, no. Yeah, I think that's. I think you're absolutely right. There was another dysfunction, and I wonder if that was also the one that you highlighted. Is that uh, while we had the code review practices and things like that, some, some, you know, in in the in this practice of agile, less uh, everyone was looking at everybody's code. So the dysfunction was that again. That's you know some people appreciate it and some people no no no. Hey, I, I've owned this for twenty years. Don't tell me how to rewrite it, right? And so now now we have we have people from one area uh, working on another area. And uh, what happens? So people have fresh ideas. People have good ideas, bad ideas, different kinds of ideas. But there's a uh, you know there's inherent inherent. I I know how to do this better. This work for for well, so that that was this function that had to be addressed for sure. Awesome. Now, I think Any it's important to notice that I didn't train them and launch them. Structure drives culture. It isn't like we trained them and we launched them and then I ran away. The truth is, I trained them, I launched, we launched them, and then I basically stood in as the uh, as the scrum master because because of lack of a better option op option at the moment. Um, uh, I basically played a, uh, a very high functioning scrum master role for, I don't know, several months. Right. Mm. Um, it, it isn't like poof, you train them and voila, now they're, and you launch them and voila, they're, they're, they're scrumming. Right. I don't know if that, I kind of saw that in one of Joel's hiding in Joel's question kind of there. That's why I mentioned that. Awesome. Okay, David, back to MC, back to you. Okay. All right, great. So the next question that's up, it's actually visible in the chat there, but it says, I'm curious what kind of training teams get before they change into a more or less like way of working. I'm using Seattle Scrum Company's video-based training to train very basic Scrum concepts and I'm assuming coaches and POs get training, but 
less <laughs> pun sure get less sure about what kind of training to offer the devs so the three day less practitioner training sounds like a big ask so what do you what do you what do you think structure is the right? drives culture there is nothing quick and easy about this we took the team down for well everybody was in two days of training and doing other work when they weren't in two days of training and then it was three or four days of launching the team, right? So that's across, you know, 40 ish people. Um, and I'm only teaching them basic scrum mechanics, right? A little bit of estimation and, uh, uh, you know, of course there's the ongoing immersive experience of, uh, how do you learn to run a retrospective well? Well, the best way is you actually go to retrospectives and you participate in them and you learn how to run good retrospectives. How do you run sprint reviews well? You participate in them and you come to understand what makes for a good sprint review. Um, same for sprint planning and all. So I'm basically coaching them through these activities, but all that we're doing in training is preparing them for that. And uh, if leadership is not willing to give uh, you know, three days of training to do something as drastic as what's involved here. Um, you're obviously not ready to even think about this kind of change. Um, this is not uh, structure drives culture. And if you don't deal with the structure, um, you will not see significant change. You will not see significant benefit. And what's interesting here is that to the extent that we dealt with structure, we reaped tremendous rewards from it. In the areas that we didn't go after the structure, so when you get above the director layer, um, we didn't fix those parts of the org and not fixing those parts of the org came back to haunt us. Um, ultimately, the reason that things disintegrated at the end, um, after I left, after Mitria left, um, was because the underlying higher level executive structures were not fixed. Um, and because I had lost some key sponsorship. Um, I think there's some notes at the very bottom of the, of that handout that may be relevant here. They're, they're alarming. And now, by the way, we were not formally speaking, implementing less. We were implementing scrum with multiple teams. And how do you do that? Well, you have a single combined product backlog. You have some sort of, you need a combined sprint, uh, sprint review, obviously. You need a uh, common definition of done because you're all touching the same code. You need, uh, uh, when you get to retrospectives, you need some sort of cross team mechanism because some things are affecting all teams and you need something that is specific to individual teams. Now it turns out that this aligns with less. Um, in fact, if you look at my website, there's an article that talks about deriving less. And if you read that, you'll see that the way less works is the natural way to run uh, multiple scrum teams in parallel. It's the very natural thing to do. Um, I don't think I'd even read Larman's books at that time. And when I read, read them as part of this, let's get the less wand, um, Everything I read was like, yeah, that makes sense. That aligns with my own experience. Um, uh, you know, uh, so there was a point here and I lost it. Oh, I remember towards the bottom, um, dealing with structure, structure drives culture. Um, so there's the first and fifth of Craig Larman's laws of organizational behavior. Organizations are implicitly optimized to avoid changing the status quo, middle and first level manager and specialist positions and power structures. In large established orgs, culture follows structure. In tiny young orgs, structure follows culture. Um, uh, parallel organization, um, this deals more with that diagnostics team, which we didn't go into. Um, uh, parallel organization is not a pilot. And there were problems there with the uh, the people on the diagnostics team continued to report up through their various directors. And those directors are still being driven by a waterfall context in the bigger picture. Um, and because we didn't deal with that structure, it caused problems. That also turned out to cause some problems for uh, BAUS. 
Um, the good news is that all the BIOS guys were reporting up to Mitria, at least within uh, North America. Um, so we didn't have that problem for quite a while. Um, but we still were faced with this waterfall context that was driving us. Um, so established, Joel, go ahead. I was just gonna pivot to Joel back one more time and see if we sure. got to the heart of his question or if you had a follow up question. Yeah, go ahead. A little, a little bit, it's been helpful, but I feel like I, I'm trying to, I'm doing a similar thing with my, my group as far as putting up less and looking at what, what elements of less are adoptable. And um, and and which are, you know we're not ready for yet or aren't aren't applicable perhaps, and so I'm trying to you know I'm trying to learn about less. That's why I'm here. Um, I'm trying to um, train a lot of my teammates on just some of the basic Scrum stuff, which is why I've been using that uh, Michael James material. Um, but I'm I'm not yet uh, certain about how much of our organization needs to go to more of a full-blown training to get less training so that they're you know, aware of that stuff versus could a lot of people just get good scrum training and have a less, you know, well-trained, less coach and a less trained uh, product owner in, in the group and could some less ex expertise in a couple of places plus some basic scrum expertise or what I mean is training, not expertise necessarily. Basically, I taught them scrum. That okay. is what I, those two days was basically scrum training. All right, that's what and I'm doing. I had some yeah. of the knowledge of how do you run it as a group. But I do right. think it's important that you deal with as much of the structural stuff up front as possible, right? And that, you know, before the launch, you were working the way you used to work. Now we're in new teams, the rules are different. You are now aligned with the scrum, the rules of the scrum guide, right? You are aligned, I would add, in the rules of less, right? Which supplement those, which are more prescriptive and avoid a lot of the traps. Um, I would, uh, I am extremely, you'll see, oh, I didn't, I should push the book, right? If I was on Jay Leno, you know, he'd, so uh, I talk about, uh, Larman calls it the contract game. Yeah. Uh, Eli Goldratt, uh, it's wordier, but it gets to the heart of it a little better, which is what I talked about here. Um, uh, he says treating estimates as commitments is in conflict with the desire of the individual to be seen as a reliable person. Hmm. And, and he elaborates on it. And I, and I basically elaborate on Goldratt's argument in here. Um, and if you treat estimates as commitments, you will destroy uh, morale and transparency within the team because you're holding people accountable for things they don't control. Yep. You will destroy uh, quality because there's not personal safety to commit to craftsmanship. Yep. And then thirdly, you will destroy forecast accuracy because now everyone is keeping the safety to themselves in gold rat terms. Um, and uh, you know, they won't tell you that they're done until uh, you know, they're within 10% or so of the forecasted time. Yep. Um, and if they think they're going to take a lot longer, they'll do what Larman would call the dirty bag of tricks and, and, uh, start cutting corners. Right. So if you do not fix the estimates being purely estimates, personal safety for craftsmanship, yeah. nothing you do is going to matter. So you absolutely have to fix that. And you'll see scrum does that, of course, with real clear role definitions. Um, the developer's role is, uh, quality, quality, quality as explicitly articulated the definition of done. And the product owner's job is what is the most important, but you can't, you don't get to say what is and isn't going to make it into the release, right? You only get to say what's most important uh, and the teams will pull from the top of the priority, right? Um, so absolutely critical that you fix that problem. Absolutely critical that you fix the engineering discipline aspects. Uh, I would argue that not, not writing automated unit testing, not doing maybe not doing tests first, but certainly not having automated unit testing um, is unprofessional. Um, I, whether or not you want to do the, 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 the uh, Bob Martin, uh, three laws, uh, TDD, you know, I'm more of a test first, less of a TDD guy. Um, I think TDD produces, there's a great hygiene practice and in some is a great shoe level technique 
can be very valuable at times. Um, but craftsmanship, 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 you absolutely have to go after that. You have to go after the personal safety and you really need your retros to run well. Yeah. Um, yeah. And then if you're finding that it takes, that it takes lots of uh, managerial protection in order to create the kind of safety that you need, which was certainly the case in this case study, um, what's becoming very clear to me from conversations with Victor as we edit my case study is that in itself is a smell, is a symptom of not dealing with structure. If you deal with the structure right up front, high enough up the food chain, and more importantly, you get above that contract game being played, um, uh, then you won't have, you won't have to have management that's providing that air cover. A lot of what happened within BIOS happened because Mitria was providing that air cover. But if the structure was right, he wouldn't have had to provide that air cover. I see. Pretty we only fixed structure at the team level. We didn't fix it at the executive level and it came down to bite us. It came back to bite us. Jerry, did you have a question? Uh, I wanted to comment because I, I think that um, the question is really important that Joel's brought up. So when I'm listening to everybody, what I'm what I'm what I'm thinking the most about is, you know, when you're first teaching Scrum, you you're somewhat doing a bottoms up, and you're teaching Scrum. What's important to understand about less and, and the lean frameworks is that it's not just Scrum. I mean, it's everything else that that James just said. You know, um, you know, what are you automating? You know, are you you know what are you what is your engineering excellence? going to be all that all that stuff and and while you can get started with just scrumming there will come a point where if you haven't socialized and got your leadership team on board with taking that training and I do think that you know three days with Craig Lehrman it's a game changer it's an absolute game changer and then you um, you're absolutely going to see an acceleration and change um, and so, you know, while you're doing what you're doing and, you know, you you know, you're there, you're teaching Scrum, you're trying to get things moving, um, find a way to get those leaders on board. I had meetings just this week where I was talking to folks. I was like, um, and, and I was like, I, you know, Craig Lambert's coming to Minnesota. I, I think we need to send these, these people and we need to send some people. And, and the response was, oh yeah, you can take those people. And I said, no, I mean, you too. Oh, me too? It's like, yeah, you, <laughs> this isn't going to work if you're not going to, leader. Um, and so you, you might need to have a number of conversations. You might need to find a way to get them to yes. Um, but if, if you don't have your leadership on board, you're only going to get so far. And, and you might be able to celebrate so much progress. Um, but at some point, you'll realize you're, you're, you're now stuck because the leadership isn't on board. And because they're not on board, you don't get the organizational redesigns. Jerry, to, to punch that point, mm -hmm. um, Mitri and I have had a conversation uh, uh, a few weeks back with uh, one, of the, one of the key sponsors, the guy who was basically approving my time cards um, uh, at this client. And we talked about, you know, doesn't it always seem to fall apart uh, in the end? And the reason it did was because we didn't deal with that at the level that we could. What makes my case study so interesting is how much went well and how much failed and the interesting ways in which it failed and the interesting ways in which it succeeded. Uh, Mitria, you want to comment on that? Like that conversation we had with, yeah. with Trent the other day was yeah. uh, insightful. Yeah. I, you know, I, th I, I, um, I agree. Um, you know, I, I, I agree that you, you have to get leadership involved and, and you know, of course, the direct management and the, the higher in the organization you go, if you manage to uh, get everyone truly on board in the, in the whole in the organization, you know, from GM or CEO, whatever the size of the organization is, I mean, like a big company, you know, 50,000, 100,000 people company, you don't have to go all the way to CEO maybe, but the GM of a business unit or something. Uh, along those lines, 
then you'd have much better success. We, we've also seen to that point, we've seen teams where uh, that, that ended up working together with a bias team. And I think they were trained, right? The um, QA team, the team members were trained, but the management of that team wasn't really on board. And so it, it, it actually caused more issues. Like they had to live between the, the waterfall model and the left model, and that made their lives more difficult. Uh, so absolutely. Remember, I lost yeah, my SVP. Yeah. yeah. That SVP that I came in and said, hey, the real question, James, is not what you can do for me. The question is, what can I do for you to help with this? And two months later, that was gone. So we would have had that, but we didn't. But, we didn't. <laughs> but yet the momentum from the initial push, uh, we managed to somehow continue to make inroads. All right, I'm going to go to the next question. So this one's from Sam, and you're free to um, you're free to jump in. Act. You want you just jump in and ask your question here, Sam. I just put it in the chat for anybody who's uh, wants to look at it. Yeah. So um, as we were talking, uh, this this question is is kind of directed to Mitya. We we talked about some of the kind of unique aspects of you know the timing of when this software is available and ready, and some of the you know the things that are at stake um, if you were to miss deadlines and things like that. So I'm wondering, kind of thinking thinking back to the adoption and the work that that you and James did together. Were there any other kind of key economic elements like that, that, that you maybe could have connected more directly to the adoption as, as you were implementing it? Um, it, it seems for me that a, a lot of times when we have these discussions, it's kind of like you're, you have to find these, these things that really you know, connect directly from what the, what the product team is, is looking at and measuring to what the, the tech team is really optimizing for, right? So I'm just curious if there was anything like that, that that you've thought about retrospectively that you might have been able to focus on more directly in terms of the, you know, you know what the adoption was optimizing for within this product. Yeah, um, yeah, that's a, that's a good question. You know, certainly some um, some parts of the development methodology we had to uh, we had to make sure fit the economics um, because you know the, the M MVP of this product, I mean, MVP of any product is critical, uh, but MVP of this product is actually quite extensive. I mean, percentage wise of the whole product, there isn't a whole lot you can, um, you can, uh, you know, you, you, so first there isn't a whole lot you can postpone uh, because, you know, mo most things are just, you know, such a low level code, it's not, there's not a lot of, uh, things that you, can, you, can, you can postpone. So that's one, that's one thing we had to deal with. And then second is um, for the things that you have to, you, you can postpone, when is the next time you can release this BIOS, right? Uh, so I, I don't know if I'm asking, answering the question. I mean, it's too, in my mind, that's uh, economical economics uh, or business at least uh, aspect. Uh, you know, in terms of economics, you know, for example, you know, hours, spend and uh, uh, dollars spent effectively on the product, uh, which, which way you know, do you get more uh, bang for the buck? You know, do you get uh, more bang for the buck when your measurement is, if I find 1000 bugs in a software, that means it's good quality. That literally is the, I don't know, uh, I'm, I'm not sure if I'm unique in, in, in existing in that kind of environment, but that's the, that's the quality uh, measurement that I was used to until then to look, we don't have any bugs to report because we, we as we go, we fix bugs. Uh, and I, I think that has, um, you know, so to, to, we, I don't have the data to say that it has measurable economic impact, but I hope it does because we only went through this uh, with one cycle. You know, it, it would be much more interesting data-wise to see when we go through this, you know, six months later, one year later, a few of these cycles, how does economics uh, of this type of approach add up? 
uh, I don't have the answer in, you know, for the, how it turned out, but uh, it's certainly, uh, it, it certainly we, we were discovering issues much, discovering defects much uh, sooner, discovering uh, design issues, you know, how components communicate to each other, both within the BIOS and outside of, you know, if you remember this picture that, that James had, right. outside of the BIOS into other components, we discovered a whole bunch of issues very early on, or much, much earlier on. And I think that had uh, economic uh, impact in terms of economics. Uh, we, you know, we were able to ship good quality code, um, you know, in the right time. But I think, you know, there, there's another, there's another part was that, and that was difficult, is that uh, we were operating in the uh, in scrum in the scrum or less as I know now less uh, model, while most of the organization was operating in the waterfall model, and so that's where the the, the air cover was required because uh, you don't you know you, you what does the rest of the organization want? They want the whole product now. When do I start QA? Oh, mm -hmm. give me the whole product and I'll start QA. Give me the whole product and I'll find all the bugs and then we'll know the quality is right. Don't don't give me this, you know, this is uh, pre MVP and and then you know you know in two weeks you deliver these features and two weeks you deliver these features and it's all it's all working because we all we tested it and we automated it. Uh, so that was, I think that also relates to that kind of relates to how other parts of the business see the economics of economics in terms of will you deliver the, the code I need to sell the product on time and with quality? It's hard for the other other parts of the business to see how you're progressing. Back to air cover. Is there any any element of your relationship with the hardware VP that played here that's relevant to the groom to the room? Uh, I, 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 you know, I, I don't know if it's my relationship or just, you know, just uh, his personal uh, kind of outlook on uh, managing teams or creating or managing organization that I think that maybe more had to do with it. But, you know, certainly, you know, he and I worked together for, um, I don't know how many years, seven years prior, or maybe you know, seven, six, seven years prior to that, uh, building this product. And uh, uh, that played a role uh, probably, but it's, I think it's more just, uh, you know, we we, um, we were very lucky that the person with this kind of outlook uh, was leading the hardware organization. So, Sam, did you have any follow-up questions before we move to the next one? Go yeah, that was that was great insight. I guess the the specifics in terms of if I in, in this organization, if I was you know, on the product side, and I'm thinking about, you know, I'm, I'm the guy that's, that's selling this, this end product to the enterprise. Were, were there any things that you could draw between what you were seeing in the, the quality improvements to, you know, specific pain points or specific kind of product strategy pieces that, that you might've been able to connect the dots more directly across from, you know, your engineering group directly into the product group? Uh, product meaning like a product management or... Right, so the, the folks that are responsible for, yeah. you know, how do we bring this product to the market and, and sell this, you know, kind of, um, you know, data center on a forklift, et cetera, to the enterprise? Was there some kind of direct connection that you think you could have made to their product strategy that, that may have changed the way that they were perceiving the transformation when you kind of started giving it water and light and all the things that you were doing? Yeah, uh, that's a good question. You know, in general, um... So first, I'm going to start directly answering questions. So on the bio side, there's historically less product involvement, like product product team, product management team involvement. You know, if you if you look at that big picture of the the whole solution, most of the product is on the hardware definition, and product is on the those higher level software middleware, as James described the definition. On the bios, it's very very less. Although, uh, you know, a lot of features that the the, the solution delivered. Uh, went all the way through from GUI all the way to the BIOS, and and on that there was a product involvement. You know, I I think there was appreciation from, uh, you know, I, I don't know. I'm ho I hope <laughs> I hope there was appreciation because we we again the one benefit uh, of this approach was that we found uh, 
um, design issues, assumptions uh, with new features that were delivered in that cycle that had to be stitched from GUI to BIOS you know, or drilled, drilled all the way from GUI to BIOS. Um, you know, with, and you, you, know, you often find, find cases where you have to go through you know, four layers of software to get some data in or some data out. So from that sense, uh, I think there was appreciation that you know, it's found early and it doesn't affect uh, the product. That doesn't affect the product launch, doesn't affect the MVP, you know, doesn't affect the, uh, what features are in the sales sheet. Uh, the next question is from Julian. I'm going to put it in the chat. And Julian, would you like to kick it off? You know, uh, thanks again, David. Um, James and Mitya, you guys have been answering this in like five different ways so far. I'm asking about communications. And I like Samuel's question as well. Um, I think the big thing I'm asking is about the SVP or the new GM that came in. Was there any retro in, in retrospect, is there anything that could have been done to convey value of what you were doing or to even work with people around his peers, his or her peer, peers, to get them bought in to the value or the efficiencies you were finding you know, that, that you were just speaking to um, using this less approach? Great question. Mitri, I think you can yep. do this better. I, I was yeah. doing everything I, I could with mostly not interest, but you've got more. You said in some meetings I didn't set in. I, you know, I think in the, in the, the new GM actually was uh, was interested, I don't know how to say pro or interested in this approach, right? Um, so on that level, it, there was an approval. The, where, where it got muddy is everywhere in between. Because it wasn't, you know, I wasn't reporting to GM. Uh, it, you know, there, there were not everybody in the organization uh, wanted this or believed in it, um, and uh, so that's on one side. On the other side, the GM wasn't involved in all the details where the project plan occurred. So it, I don't know if I'm answering your question directly. But express no interest. Yeah, uh, this the, the new the new GM's uh, optimizing goal was overall profitability, and I, if I have to cut the headcount in half, so be it. Um, and this is not a bad person. This is a very bright person. This was a person who was sent in to <clears throat> do what is needed to return this this division to a more profitable state in the short term. And yeah. that may mean some uncomfortable decisions. So, so I, th I think the, the question is more around in retrospect, what could have you done differently to engage that person yeah. for a better effect? You know, one thing that just occurred to me, Julian, is that, uh, and I, I am, I'm not, I, I mean, I may not be, uh, this may not be the strongest. So I believe in like, fixing everything myself and doing everything myself. But, uh, but you know, this was a few years ago and I've learned a few things since then. And one valuable thing that I've learned since then is that there is a value in escalating problems and, uh, you know, escalating problems when sometimes they may not be comfortable for everybody to hear problems. So maybe that's one thing that, you know, we could have done differently is to just say, hey, this thing that you like to be done and we like to be done and uh, is not really been being done in the middle, right? Maybe like to actually uh, vividly highlight this problem that if we are to really change this organization as an organization, uh, we have to, everybody has to change. And I don't know if we, we, we probably did, you know, highlight that, that, you know, we need more help and, you know, to kind of softly, but, uh, I don't know. I, I, I've seen this. Thing. I, I've seen um, kind of these escalations, and uh, uh, you know, leaders sometimes need to know exactly the full picture and not figure figure it out themselves. Mm -hmm. I don't know, James. If that's yeah, that's. I, I don't know. 
could you have given him some less training like some system modeling or anything i tried things? everything okay yeah. <laughs> nothing in my Just skill set ask. at the time yeah. Yeah, they were, yeah, everybody. I think everybody in the organization, in the organization was trained. Uh, you know, it wasn't lack of knowledge, but uh, again, so. But Julian, to answer also a few questions, quite honestly, I, I don't know. I, I hope that today I'd be able to walk to the GM and say, look, you know, we've got this big problem. There's a group that is doing this, and there's a group that is doing this, and everybody else is not doing this. And unless we're doing it all together, we're not going to be able to succeed. Uh, you know, in my imagination. <laughs> I am doing that, but uh, I don't know. Next time we'll see. All right. So Spoken Vlad... as a future VP, see? Yeah. <laughs> so Vlad's got some good follow-up questions here in the chat. Uh, Vlad, do you want to uh, you know, put it in your own words there? Uh, thank you. And yeah, well, pretty much uh, I'm interested to know more of the details of what uh, Julian asked, like what uh, was VP was looking for instead of Scrum, and what was the argument, and where it was a struggle to kind of get the new VP on board. Mitri, I think the focus was just elsewhere, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah. I think it was. It was uh... You know, it, it, it was a mandate to go and do it, but uh, it wasn't really. Yeah, I think James focus is a good, 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 good word, good term. That uh, the actually the focus of you know actually accomplishing this, like what are the ways that you actually do it, was elsewhere. You know, maybe for the good reasons. You know, the business needed adjustment and alignment. You know, there was a it was a lot of that required a lot of time that required a lot of uh you know things from business side and uh emotionally like james said that you know the business unit went through layoffs um within that year that we were implementing this uh, less um and so i don't think it was v, v, it was gm i think we're talking about gm or vp yeah yeah gm yeah svpm yeah uh, it wasn't that uh, they didn't believe it, but uh, it was, sounds nice, you have my full support to go do it, right? But not, uh, you know, there's a difference between you can go do it, I support you to, hey, is this done? Is it, can we have a daily meeting because this is not done? This is, I, I sense this is not getting done. Can we meet daily until everybody's on board, right? Um, I think Lizzie the complete Mary, I opposite know. of James, the real question is not what you can do for me, but what can I do to help you help me, right? You tell me what you need. The door is open, you know, feel free to come in every day to the door was effectively closed. Was there any dismantling of Scrum or, or of cross functional cross component teams or was this new person uh do they not the care? devolution or... happened once you left right mitria yeah, yeah on the bio it, side it was, yeah the, the the dismantling happened in that you know in, in the middle from the middle a, a dismantle uh like um dismantling meaning like the the you know this was a nice experiment let's all go back to the way we used to do things componentized teams yeah I assume a, a, the yeah. previous way of doing things yeah. It's that third org change uh, that you want to look at. Figure 13. Therein started the doom. Let's go back to what was before, because before it was so wonderful. Well, before, well, figure 11 was great. Figure 12 was the new SVP is saying what Mitria just said, hey, go forth, that's fine. Continue to, we'll continue to pay James's uh, bill rate, um, but we're not gonna actively like get that engaged because we're busy with some other stuff, but at least we're still going through this hardware VP and the hardware VP is telling Mitria, hey Mitria, do what you think makes sense. And so as long as Mitria and I are doing what we think makes sense, 
as long as the, the, the testing people on the team are reporting up through someone who's protecting, uh, helping protect us as well, uh, we were good. As soon as that hardware VP left and we have weak support or sort of indifferent support when it comes to day-to-day, -day, let me help reach down and solve problems for you from the GM level, um, that's when things really started to collapse. That, that software VP had been eroding what had been done in the uh, diagnostic effort, which we didn't cover much. That had already happened a good bit. But certainly when bio started reporting into that new, uh, that new software VP and we lost the air cover from the hardware VP, which is figure 13, that was the beginning of the end. If you leave this kind of person who doesn't wanna do this, and I'm not saying this was a bad person, very skilled, very intelligent, probably means well, but definitely not on board, right? If you leave that type of resistor in a significant managerial capacity, um, it is poisonous to any adoption efforts. Um, and that was the case here. Poisonous? I would assume that the, the organization wasn't trying to commit suicide here, that this person, this VP that's not on board with this adoption, there was a reason that they were there. There's a reason the previous one resigned. It sounds like there's more to the story, maybe, that, you know, the people pulling the levers thought that empowering this VP who wasn't on board was smart. Or was it, was well, if, if we're, so if the hardware VP left because there was a more attractive offer externally, okay? Okay. And because they were under the threat, a looming, looming threat of, uh, uh, of significant layoffs, right? Yeah. And if your job as a GM is to come and you have come to the conclusion after working with the organization, working with the division for about a year, you've come to the realization that of all the various approaches I've looked at that might be able to save the organization without a massive layoff, and none of them, in my judgment, seem to be the right thing, I'm going to have to make a massive layoff. I mean, like, we're going to go from, like, 4,000 to 2,000 people, okay? So massive, massive cut. Um, I've lost my hardware VP. Do I really want to lose this seasoned engineer who's a VP down in the trenches who understands where the bodies are buried, may or may not agree with this new Agile thing, but we're about to cut half the staff. Do I really want to lose that knowledge and have that walk out the door? Especially because in my GM role, I'm probably looking to go to the next division that may need this kind of heavy help, uh, of help, right? Of massive turnaround help. So my job as a GM is to get in, turn it around and uh, get out. And if I decapitate the the sole VP that's left that has a clue of what the overall system is doing, then I'm kind of in a bad situation, even if they're not on board with the, the agileness, right? I'm not saying I agree with that decision. I'm simply saying that I, I can understand that perspective. Mitria, do you, any, any politically safe things to say here? <laughs> uh, you know, I, I, I agree with, Joel, that, uh, you know, you're absolutely correct that it's not like one way was, uh, you know, just nosedive, right? And, and another way was the opposite, right? Of, uh, you know, we're bringing this rocket into space, right? Uh, the, the old way worked to a degree with its inefficiencies, with its problems. And, uh, you know, frankly, I think to the most people, most people didn't have amazing experience working in that air, in that uh, environment. You know, in the, in, in, people don't have, I think, good experience working in an environment where you're told the your ETA, and then you're held accountable to your ETA. Mm. Um, you know, for example, I mean, there are many examples, <laughs> but this is one. Yeah. And uh, but on the other hand, you know, if you take an organization of 
I don't know, a thousand people, what is the percentage uh, that will say, no, 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 I'm not doing this agile thing. I know what I'm doing. I know the software piece that I'm working on. I know what I'm, how long it took me to, how long it will take me to write this new feature because I wrote one just like this, you know, 30 times before. Uh, and this new agile thing will, will make me uncomfortable. People have that reaction. People had that reaction in, uh, in the bias team and, you know, that requires a lot of work. Uh, from you know, from side of James and, and myself to guide them through it, and that kind of work would require the whole organization. Should the whole organization would would go through this transformation? And I think James correctly pointed out that you know the business um, objective at the moment was not to rework organization; it was to you know to to make the business. Uh, Keep the business viable, which it still is, and uh, so they, you know they kind of achieve their objective. So at the time, re re reworking the whole organization was, I think, uh, prohib prohibitive, honestly, in you know in many ways. Even though it would fix the long-term problem, if you wanted to yeah. fix the strategic long-term innovation adaptability, you'd have to go down the path that Mitri and I were going down. Um, I but. If you're just trying to stop the initial bleeding, it's a little different story. Yeah, I think that's where system modeling comes in. So you can help people connect those multi-layer dots, like how this impacts that, right? It's it's uh, maybe it's too simple. <laughs> if it's people's mind, don't, <laughs> I don't know. Um, so it, yeah, yeah. Go so, ahead, Vlad. So 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 leadership. Many times, leadership not sure about whether one way or another is better. And they tend to follow some strong voices of some of the technical leads or some managers saying like, I am I am going to solve all your problems. Just give me people and I will do this for you because I have qualifications. I am an architect, I am a technical guy and then forget agile. So leadership say like, okay, this guy will solve my problems. But the question is, like, how how do we actually deliver value? I mean, is value value visible? I mean, if the pro if the product is evolving rapidly and delivers a lot of value, that's success. And then the leadership would say, well, I want to do it the same way in that group and this group. But if it doesn't happen, then the question here, like, what happened? Why why would why wouldn't the, the new VP just say, okay, we're going to continue doing this because it's going very well. Was he struggling to see the value of it? I, obviously, yes. Um, but obviously not giving significant time and energy to finding out there's not a, there's not an openness to those discussions i didn't have those discussions there was not an opportunity to have those discussions that's that's tough that's like when craig larman says you know you don't deal with the no-nos the people who are not willing to change you got to change your organization <laughs> unless you can go above them i guess you know i find the so we can talk about structure here a little bit. Um, you'll notice that the ideal less structure is there's head of product, and then you've got your product owners, your teams, your scrum masters, everybody's very flat underneath that, right? There are no management layers. They're not, they're not there. Mm -hmm. And then the other side, if you read between the lines is, okay, if they are there, you put them in an impediment service, and they're being held accountable for removing impediments and moving the organization along, right? Um, now, how do you get to that state? You either go and, I don't wanna say demote everybody while keeping their salary the same, but you either go and change their reporting structures and say, hey, regardless of title, you're now on a team. I don't know how you feel about that. Um, or uh, you get to choose what team you're on, <laughs> but you're gonna be on a team. Um, or you build a parallel org and you avoid all the politics and you recruit into that parallel org 
and you build up this new parallel org. Now there the problem becomes, how do you build a bubble? Um, and the challenge is from a product perspective. If it's a brand new product, it's easy. You go do that. But if you have an existing product, that's a harder strategy to implement um, to build that parallel org. But one of the advantages of that parallel org is that you don't have that middle. You kind of build it like a startup from day one. Um, and what middle you do, you know, they know, they know walking into the door that they A, have to be on board with this kind of management paradigm and this kind of structure. And B, if they're in a management role, they're probably going to be helping to remove impediments. Their job is to to make management accountable for delivery is to disempower the people doing the work. The role of management is to create the ecosystem that makes it possible for the teams to take ownership and do the work and deliver, right? But we don't want to disempower the people doing the work. And as soon as you start making management accountable for, you better hit this scope by this date and make sure your guys get on board you're basically disempowering the teams instead of gardening, which is what was expected of a manager in a, in a, in a, in a, in a scaled agile context. That's a proper, you know, if we're talking nexus, we're talking less something healthy. Um, Dealing with that. How do you strike that balance right now? And I work at a so-called startup, but it's, we just hired an awful lot of managers into the organization and, they're some of our very newest employees and me, their coach is already saying, and what are you going to do? Hmm. Get over there and stay out of our way, please. They don't like to hear that at all. Oh, we'll get you something to do. You can go chase down impediments for us. They don't want to hear that either. So the best I give to them is you and me are going to be working on creating that environment that makes all this possible. And some of them. And what you really need is their boss to get online on board with yeah. this structure and then have honest, open conversations with these people that have been hired and say, you know, if this is the structure we want and this is, you can do system modeling, this is all the reasons we want this. Um, what is the best thing from your career management perspective? Do you want to be a member of a team? Do you want to be on impediment service? Or do you think that we should help you find a role outside of the company and be supportive of your decision to do that. It may come to that. And anything short is probably just setting yourself up for trouble. I'm worried about that. And having well, those conversations yeah. is setting yourself up to get kicked out the door. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> Joe, I mean, you're absolutely right. Uh, I mean, to, to right to worry and, and uh, you know, be, I don't know, worry, maybe worry for yourself, but also worry for them, right? They, they, they'll find themselves in unknown territory. You know, I've seen, I've seen, it sounds like I've seen the same things that you have where, you know, managers say all of a sudden, not, not managers that report to me, but managers that are my peers that say, no, no, wait a second. I create task lists and then I divide the task list and then I follow up whether the tasks are done. If that is done somehow organically within the teams, themselves and team members themselves uh what do i do uh well yeah. you, you 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 know you, you fulfill your role as a manager you coach you uh i think you 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 put it actually very i, I love the way you said it uh you go what do you, how do you say you, you go and build the environment i think that's what you said yeah I, I, yeah so yep. there, there is a certain psychological problem here a psychological problem for a manager is that the information the higher level manager gets from different places at times makes them wonder what's going on, why those guys cannot fix all these problems. Let me try and do this. I will tell them what to do and everything will be hunky-dory. It is so tempting to fix it and step in and be a hands-on manager and tell people what to do and keep people over or a weekend and be a hero. That's, see, that's a psychological problem of waterfall being on top and agile on the bottom. And if you any- You gotta get rid of waterfall on the top. Well, if, and the, any, if any leader has, uh, has to say when this feature will be in production on which date, that's a waterfall mentality. 
Okay. So, so we to we're talking timelines for delivering certain features in production. I think the real fix here is that senior manager uh, observes the behavior of the middle manager. And when the middle manager starts to act like a traditional middle manager, rather than I'm a gardener, how do I create the ecosystem? The senior manager steps in and says, uh, I'm sorry, I think we need to have a conversation. Your role, is, you are not accountable for delivery. I will never hold you accountable for delivery. I will hold you accountable for creating the right ecosystem, right? Um, and to the extent that you, that you violate this expectation of the role, you will be held accountable to the extent that you, that you uh, in, a, in a negative way, um, to the extent that you, that you uh, are helping to create a positive ecosystem and, and working hard and we all make mistakes and that's fine and we'll learn from them. Um, uh, well, that's great. And how can I help you and guide you in that, right? So it, really the problem is usually at least one level up, right? It's why is that manager acting the way that manager is acting? Well, it's probably because of a problem in the thinking of the person they're reporting to. No, no. I have a, I see that, I don't know what you guys are up for time-wise, but I have a comment on that. And I see there's another question that you queued up that I've asked. Um, I'll take whatever you guys are willing to offer. Yeah, go ahead. Today I had a conversation with one of the new managers I was referring to, and he asked me how to help set up the Azure DevOps tool so that he can see what his people are doing, and um, and he want he wanted to understand the work that he's being accounted accountable for, and how it percolates through the system to so so he can see his people and what they're doing. And I said, um, I understand why you're asking that, and I understand what you're what you're trying to get here, but I have a counter proposal I'd like you to hear. He said. I'd love for you to come to our backlog refinement meetings because he has work that he wants to get done. But I said, come to our backlog refinement meetings and uh, and influence the you know product owner, you know, and team about the importance of this work. So there's a place you can get work kind of injected into the process, and then uh, at the sprint uh, review, you can see the results of those requests and be a, you know you're a stakeholder in this case, and. Don't worry about what happens between those two points. Do refinement. You can check in on our planning. Um, come to our reviews, but um, please don't micromanage your people who are on our cross-functional team. And he responded pretty well to that. I think he, he could get where I was going with that line of uh, conversation to basically say, "We don't want you trying to uh, monitor your people so closely." Um, and because they're on, they're part of a cross-functional team, and I'm their coach, and you don't have to worry about you know are they busy or whatever. That's no no problem there. Um, he responded pretty well to that, but he he said, well, I've got goals that I need to meet that my manager has for me, and I and I used one of those as an example. I said, well, you know what? Let let's hear one of your goals, and that goal, I share that goal with you and another one of our peers is you know, some sort of a manager or something. And he has that goal too. So all three of us have a, the same goal. And so let's not call that your team's goal. That's all of our shared goal. So you aren't gonna be able to monitor the delivery of your goal through your people because it's a cross-functional goal. And it seemed to be, it makes sense to him that this crazy scrum thing that we're doing is it does work. It just is different than what he's familiar with because he's used to just being in tune with his, you know, the people that report to him. He's not used to cross-functional teams where that's different. Joel, it yep. might, I don't know, but there's an idea. As you describe the problem, I'm thinking to myself, and it's easier as a third party because, you know, sure. uh, uh, maybe if you and the manager and the product owner and maybe that manager's manager got into a room and had a discussion and you talk through, you know, obviously we don't want to hold the manager accountable for delivery because that disempowers the team doing the work, right? Yeah. Um, we all have this as a common goal. So we want to make sure that the product owner is prioritizing things in a way that will help us achieve these goals 
yep. and do whatever we can, see if the product owner has any challenges. And then maybe there's something about the value of estimates as estimates, avoiding the contract game. Maybe there's a causal loop. You know, how can you facilitate a discussion, especially since you seem to have somewhat open, you have a manager who's somewhat open to this conversation, right? So it's, you're not in a, a, a uh, you're in a good place there. Very. So yeah. maybe there's a way to, to get the right people in a room and talk through the conflicts and come out of it with what sounds like you would come out of it with is, yes, we thought we had a conflict, but the truth is we were violently in agreement. We just didn't, we were just doing things that were not in alignment with what we actually wanted and didn't even realize it. And now we're on the same page and uh, we are aligned and your problem goes away. Uh, you might even have the senior executive say, well, I didn't mean for your goal to be written that way because I realized that I put you in conflict. Let's change that. Let's make it the product owners, or I don't know. Let's let's change this in a way that it's reflect that is respectful of the people doing the work, is respectful of what we know about the contract game, is respectful of you know everything we know from agile lean theory. Um, maybe that would work. Maybe it wouldn't. I don't know. I I think I have. I have it easy in this particular, it's, it's a full-time job, but you know, this, it's like an engagement sort of, uh, a lot of openness. And I'm, I'm trying to take as much advantage as I can of that, you know, for good to, like, as I said earlier, win the hearts and minds of managers to uh, support the way that we're working. And they love the idea that rather than create yet another meeting where we synchronize about these things that were like, no, there's a place for that. It's called backlog refinement and planning and review and, and, and you know, maybe parking lot after stand up or something. Um, so there's, there's a, a desire to reduce our meeting load. And I have a desire to get us into one more coherent process that we're adopting instead of a foot in less and a foot in waterfall and a foot in scrummer fall or <laughs> whatever. Um, and this is one way to get there is to, is to utilize the meetings that we already have on the books for, you know, for better outcomes. And that's, that's great. So that that's really helps all insight. Us. Look, it's more efficient. Yeah, I, I just, I really uh, kind of hooked onto this whole talk about goals and conflicting goals. And if, I mean, if you're trying to coach an organization and you see different managers with different goals, it's time to go talk to their manager and be like, Hey, this is kind of destroying the system here. It's destroying our output, our throughput of value. And this is what I'm seeing. Like, what do you think about that? Do you see that having these different goals, like not being aligned? Uh, do, do you, I mean, can you imagine how like you're seeing what I'm seeing? Cause what I see is I got, you know, different teams with number one priorities. They're trying to use constrained resources for their own benefit, local optimizations and all that stuff. I mean, I see it all the time and it's like, if you can identify those things and bring it to the person who made it so, I mean, I think that's a, that's a great start to start dismantling some of that dysfunction. Well, yeah, David, you hit the nail on the head by talking about goals because the conflict of goals and especially the goals that we don't know about. So like a hidden agenda of certain people in, in the team is driving the decisions like the new VP came and it is very possible that the new VP was convinced by some other people or maybe by his previous experience that things need to be done differently. And there was no other evidence or you know strong voice the opposite way. I just don't think we're gonna squeeze a lot more out of that conversation. <laughs> I mean, I, I think we've squeezed what we can is the what little insight that I have to give that Mitra has to give. Um, David, you got us a new nasty question? Something meaty? Oh, you're on mute, bud. Yeah, this one's from Joel. And I put it in the chat a little while ago. He wanted to explore the adoption versus transformation spectrum. Uh, it, it sounded kind of abrupt from what he heard you say. Uh, was it abrupt? Was it gradual? And uh, yeah. Oh, okay. So this is, this is kind of easy. 
So you're flying an airplane and you have no, uh, you have no instruments, right? You don't even know, you don't know what the RPM is. You don't know what your airspeed is. You don't know what your, your angle of attack is. You don't know anything. You just know you got a plane, you got a stick and that's it, right? And uh, you don't even know what your ground speed, you don't know anything, right? And the question is, well, how do you improve? Well, okay, now you go and you put a bunch of instrumentation on and you ask them, uh, so, so how much better are you flying the plane now than you were? I don't know. I didn't have any instrumentation before. Now, the process of doing that instrumentation is drastic. One day it didn't have all this instrument panel. The next day it did. The process of slowly learning to fly the plane better happens over time. So obviously in the same way, the analogy is obvious here, which is before we formed the teams, we didn't know any of this stuff. We formed the teams, that structural change of we were not running in a less stock structure, you know, yesterday and today we are. That change was overnight. How many not teams? unlike the the David Marquette when he talks about the turn the ship around and you know the, the rule changes overnight. Yeah. The process of learning and growing through uh, inspection and adaption and improving things and learning, oh, well, we should be moving farther up the stack, um, that uh, we should be cross-training more. And all of this stuff happens slowly and organically. But putting the instrumentation panel in place, that happened effectively overnight, right? We trained and we launched them. How many teams did you, did you involve in that overnight change? Three. And then we rolled in two more within a few months. Okay. Okay. I thought it was more than that because this was. No, no, no. Because there's thousands of people. Yeah. But this is effectively, if you did this from less and you were doing a formal less huge or the whole darn thing, this definitely fits in the less huge, right? And you would do it one requirement area at a time, right? That's even in the less rules. So you could argue that this BIOS was the first requirement area except it was really a com- extended component team and we were only working our way slowly to stretch up to the surface, right? Um, but even if you had done that initially, you would have a single requirement area and that one requirement area was done instantly. But we even used the hardware generation as one of the dimensions of the component boundary or of the, of the less product group boundary, if you will, right? A very odd thing that we did clever creative served its purpose you might not always have that opportunity uh the opportunity existed because of some really bad code management practices in the past right copy paste reuse but we leveraged that past bad behavior to our benefit um as a as an adoption boundary okay good yeah David, what what, what <laughs> metrics? Sorry, I just I did this burning question. So, what metrics? Uh, you, you're talking about the metrics on the, the airplane, right? So, were there any metrics that you set out with that we're you're, we're going to improve this, this, and this, doing this? And I'll show you after a few months they'll improve. Was there anything like that, or was it kind of a leap? Of Nothing faith? other than the standard scrumminess, right? The uh, uh, you know, are our retrospectives creating actionable things that we take care of in the next sprint? Um, do we have a well-refined product backlog where we know what we have, right? Um, uh, we did track velocity, but we didn't beat people up with it, right? We certainly were forecasting. Are we going to get down to this MVP line that we need to be at before Intel in order to take that train ride of the marketing train ride with Intel uh, that Mitri was discussing? discussing? What about we were like certainly fe- focusing on that, right? What about like feature uh, cycle time or release cycle time? Any kind of like speed to market? Anything? Not, anything not like in that? that way. No. Okay. That's okay. Now, That's right. what's interesting if you talk about the diagnostics? For the diagnostics, we were able to do cost of delay mm-hmm. per PBI. So every PBI added a new diagnostic capability, and there were enough analytics. This thing is deployed in the field to a large enough number of customers, and the people that are in the the hands-on high-tech customer service. These are like 
oh, you have a problem? We will pick up the phone. Oh, you need us on a, on a corporate jet? And we'll fly a technician to you. I mean, you know, whatever you need, we will get you back up and your trading system or whatever will be up, you know, instantly. Um, mm. This is not, uh, I'm sorry, uh, if, you, uh, if you don't like this, please, please hit five. You know, would you like us to call you back slowly? This is, <laughs> this is gold plated kind of support, right? Which is what you expect when you write a multi-million dollar check for these kind of products, right? Um, uh, but cost of delay diagnostics um there were groups that had done the analytics that the diagnostics team was actively working with and they could say we get x number of units returned per month because of problems with these memory chips and they get we get them back in and we find out that the problem is is a ghost it's not real it wasn't truly failed failed or we have so many problems with this network controller and we get a lot of false positives where we think there's a problem and there isn't a problem. And after the customer has a problem like two or three times, and remember they're paying amazing amounts of money for these products, we say, you know what, don't worry about it. We will ship you a whole new, a whole new thing, right? So we'll ship you several million dollars of brand new equipment because we can't seem to diagnose this thing for you in the field, but we're gonna keep you happy, right? And so they could say, ability to diagnose these memory chips is, and detect this kind of failure is worth this dollar amount per month. Ability to detect this kind of problem in the network card is worth this much money per month for every month that we don't have a way to better, to better diagnose it. This other kind of problem in the network card is worth this amount of money. And we could take the product backlog and we could rank it by what is what is bleeding the most and what was Good. crazy is that the amount of money that was bled in one month was radically rat dra- you know orders of magnitude more than the cost of the team That's and the awesome. problem had still not been addressed for years now bios is a different story because it was down in the weeds and as mitry was saying to some extent does it come on does the green light come on? If it is, then it is it connect, then it's good. Uh, there wasn't a lot of, uh, you know, you guys do, you guys do six months, nine months of really hard work across a large number of teams. I mean, across a large number of people, you know, 40, 50 people. And all we really care about in the end is that it works the same way that it worked in the previous hardware. It still comes on, it still boots, it still connects to everything it's supposed to. And it just has all the new functionality that the old stuff had. Oh, and by the way, we add some new stuff, but the new stuff is small in comparison to, uh, so is that, okay, metric, that was the metric yeah. answer. No, that was good. That was really good. Thank you. Appreciate that. Do anyone have any, from, yeah, go ahead. Question from Jeff, uh, I just see in the chat, uh, did, did the project eventually get completed or did the whole product line fail? The project uh, did complete and the product line still exists. It didn't fail. Although I, I don't have any information whether they're doing any kind of scrum or complete waterfall. We have strong suspicions. <laughs> yeah, wouldn't that software yeah. be? Look, we should. <laughs> yeah. All right. Any other questions before we wrap up? We can probably do one more if there's another one. I wanted to ask, if you don't mind, I wanted to ask specifically of what measurements were used to de- determine success and progress as well. Um, and of course, many times we may, people who know, who heard about Scrum and, and Agile, they talk about velocity. And we know how dangerous is that to measure velocity as a progress. So. And this is my problem as well. I really would like to shift from velocity to something else. And I'm hearing here monetary values like dollars. That's great. That's as a value. So what else in your practice, in your adoption of Glass and Scrum, you used uh, to to justify the new approach, to actually show the value of a new approach and, and, and understanding the successes achieved or 
good progress towards success. Mitre, can you can you go after this one? I mean, we just it just felt better. <laughs> we had more visibility. We had less problems. We didn't have big bug lists. Um, but you may have. I'm, can I'm you give something you, more I, concrete I got... here? So the question is, what what metrics did we have? How did we know that things were getting better? Yeah, and I, you know, to, to me, there are two two parts that are important to measure. One is the product better, uh, product delivery better, maybe three, product better, product delivery better, and is people experience better. So we don't have people here, uh, you know, other people from the team to, 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 to speak for that, but um, at least James, correct me if I'm wrong here, but I do, I, I think, you. you know, I think that uh, people's experience was better measurably. 100%, not 100%. You know, there's probably, I mean, there's a, there's a good, I don't know, uh, maybe 20% at least of the team, um, 15, 20% that did not have great experience with Scrum. But others had a much better experience. Others who have uh, maybe were not able to develop themselves as, you know, as, as even though they were leaders, uh, and I'm thinking of one example specifically. Uh, this person was a leader in, uh, in 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 her technical field, but she was not able to kind of uh, be seen by everybody as a leader. And it, it was immediately clear that uh, you know she just kind of organically became the, the team that she was part of elected her to be the 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 the, the uh, kind of the, the team lead the. Uh, of the Scrum team, and uh, uh, she had an uh, amazing role in uh, making a lot of things work better. So, so that that part uh, is measurable, I believe, and, and while not in 100% uh, better, but it is better in, in many people. Um, the delivery, so we, we did launch the product uh, with Intel and uh, you know, did not delay due to any BIOS issues or BIOS MVP or, you know, feature lacking. So that is measurably, you know, measurably succeeded. Um, it would have showed up in the next generation. It would have shown up big time. Would, yeah. The next hardware generation, we would have taken a new chipset and, mm. you know, everything would be in the pluggable layer. We would run a bunch of tests. We wouldn't have as much test as we needed, and we'd have to focus on getting more of them. There'd still be things that we ironed out. But I bet a new chipset, that same team, had those same teams, had they been left alone, and we not done massive layoffs and all of this, um, I bet they could have handled the new generation of chipset in, I don't know, what, half the time? Uh, Dimitri, you can tell yeah. me. Uh, yeah, uh, for sure, uh, half the time, um, maybe even a little bit better. Uh, and the one after that would have been even faster. Had we kept going the direction we yeah. were going, this ability to take a new chipset, like, yeah. You know, oh yeah, we're, we're done with that. What's next? Uh, <laughs> what got there? We don't have the data because uh, so I I also left the company. Uh, I, I left the company I think three four months four months after the th that particular product was launched, and um, that's almost not enough time in that business to to know the the bugs you have to you have to really do you know six eight months to to see the large deployments to see to see bugs and uh, to see defects from from the field and to see how you did in terms of finding defects without without having bug reports finding defects and fixing defects and um, you know one thing that is that uh, uh, I don't I think James mentioned that you know in automation we could have done better in automation. We've, we've tried to do a lot of things in automation, but that that firmware BIOS is very difficult to automate. Um, not all the firmware is difficult to automate. Some is, is very automatable, but particularly, you know, x86, the, the, the compute BIOS is hard. And so um, it would be interesting to know if we missed anything because we're not shipping the you know, the code complete product to QA so that they find bugs. Instead, we kind of layer the features 
and test as we go and uh, automate as much as possible. But so, so unfortunately we don't have the data to say how we did from quality point of view, but I haven't heard anything terrible. Qualitatively, we know it was better. Is yeah. that fair? Yeah, yeah. So, so Vlad just got a quick follow up here. So was there anything other than bugs and velocity used as a measurement? Routinely every sprint. Yeah, every sprint. Well, we didn't track bugs, we just squashed them. <laughs> uh, first off, I mean, where, where there were bugs that would show up, they were like, oh crap, we found a bug, we didn't know it. And you know, we'll, we'll deal with it in the next sprint. But more or less, we stopped. We didn't track massive bug list. We didn't make bugs. We, as soon as we had a engineer would fix, you know, do some dev, the tester would immediately hit it. Oftentimes they were swapping roles to some extent, right? Certainly the engineers were, were being cross-trained by the testers and the testers were somewhat being cross-trained by the engineers, uh, by the, by the software engineers. Um, uh, but, uh, and also it's been a long time, but no, we did not come in here and do some, let's generate all our KPIs. We said, let's get transparency. Let's get, uh, you know, let's know where we're going. Let's get visibility into what's going on with a single consolidated product backlog. Let's have retrospectives that work and start to, to improve things from that, those retrospectives. Um, and let's make sure that, uh, sadly, let's not crank our quality standard our definition of done, let's not crank it to maximum so fast that it forces us to miss that Intel release. So although we would love to have had uh, test-driven development at the BIOS level for everything, the truth is that it took a tremendous amount of work just to figure out how to do test-first development which we did have a guy who was working on that and we did figure out how to do it. We had a kind of prototype working and that was kind of towards the end of the effort. Um, but most of the effort was in that higher level uh, automation, but we were working down the stack. We were working down the test pyramid. Um, we were going after the problem slowly, but if we had stopped and said, we're not going to release this until it's all perfect. And by the way, we're going to take years and years and years of changes that have been copy pasted from one branch to the next, to the next, to the next. And we're going to migrate all of that into the pluggable layer. And we're going to do it with perfect unit testing as we do it and all sorts of other, you know, uh, we're going to run uh, static code analysis on the, on the code and get those static code analysis perfect and everything. If we had done it as well as one would hope, we would have missed the Intel date. So what we had to do is let's make it as good as we can afford to make it. Let's stop doing the copy paste. Let's start using the pluggable layer. Let's bring QA into the team. Let's start automating as much as we can because the formal release management is sluggish and problematic and outside of our control. We put our own uh, CI tooling so that anytime we checked in, it ran the build and it ran the tests that we had available. Um, and we brought that into the, the scope of what the teams could do for themselves instead of relying on external parties to do. Um, so we did as much improvement as we could while, while not going as far as I would like it to go. Um, and that was a call that Mitria as sort of a fake product owner, fake because he wasn't really in product management because it wasn't a true requirement area. It was really a, a component owner, right? Um, uh, had to make that delicate judgment there, right? Um, less than ideal, but we were rapidly getting better. And I, and I really think that had time gone on, we could have improved that automation even more, improved the engineering practices even more, um, cross-training more. We would have gone up through all the layers more and had less problems of external dependencies because the team was doing all that work themselves. And we would have eventually had spare capacity and said, ah, let's start chewing into other functionality that has nothing to do with BIOS, right? And then of course that hardware, that hardware, sorry, that software VP would have been either even more challenged 
to politically defend what was going on. Right. The fact that the hardware, the hardware group is doing all kinds of amazing stuff in a very difficult environment and the quality that's being produced and the forecast accuracy of what's being produced up in the software middleware stuff is in no way at the same level as what these guys down in the, in the, uh, 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 in the depth and the deep dark, uh, <laughs> Uh, esoteric component are starting to achieve, right? I'm a, I want to be sensitive to Mitria's time. Mitria, yeah. it sounds like you're starting to get pulled. Well, we're at about two hours yeah. and 40 minutes here. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we're pretty far in. <laughs> but, um, so is that okay if we call it here, guys? And gals? It's just guys. Um, <laughs> that was a great, great meetup. I uh, really appreciate James and Mitria uh, joining us today.